Good afternoon. Welcome to Book Passage. My name is Jonathan Spencer. I'm the assistant manager here, and I'm very, very happy to join you today, both in, in the store and online. We're uh, thrilled today that we are going to be have our guest author, Amanda Tyler, who is joining us to talk about her compelling new book, How to End Christian Nationalism, an essential guidebook for Christians alarmed by the rising tide of Christian nationalism, yet unsure how to counter it. Amanda will be joined in conversation today by our special guest, Congressman Jared Huffman. Uh, early critical and peer reviews call this work an energetic debut, effectively sounding the alarm on the rising threat of Christian nationalism and its harms to both the church and the country. It has also been lauded as an indispensable tool in renewing civic engagement and democracy in America in these polarizing times. With the rise of theocratic authoritarian organizations, How to End Christian Nationalism is a foundational text for anyone who cares not only about America's past, but about its future. And one of the things I like to do when I'm looking through these uh, uh, thoughts from different authors and critics is to choose a favorite. And so this is the one that I selected. With the precision of an attorney and the practicality of an organizer and advocate, Amanda Tyler helps us see what we can do to defeat the biggest threat to American democracy today. This timely and insightful book does more than just sound the alarm. It passionately lays out a call to action. Amanda Tyler is the lead organizer of the Christians Against Christian Nationalism campaign. She serves as the executive director of the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty and is also the co-host of their Respecting Religion podcast. Her constitutional analysis and advocacy for faith freedom for all has been featured on many major news outlets, including the New York Times, Washington Post, CBS News, ABC News, CNN, and MSNBC, and she has testified before Congress on religious liberty and Christian nationalism. She will be in conversation with Jared Huffman, who represents California's 2nd Congressional District, which spans the north coast of the state from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Oregon border, a long, long district, and includes Marin, Sonoma, Mendocino, Humboldt, Trinity, and Del Norte counties. He was first elected to Congress in November 2012. He also founded the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, which he co-chairs, to promote sound public policy based on reason, science, and moral values while protecting the secular character of government and championing the value of freedom of thought worldwide. Please put your hands together and welcome them to the stage. Thank you for that introduction, Jonathan. Welcome, uh, everyone. It's great to see you here, and uh, welcome especially to my friend Amanda Tyler. So I'm going to uh, hand off to the star of the show here pretty shortly, but to set us up for this conversation. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the work that I do with Amanda. Um, this threat of Christian nationalism uh, has been described as the greatest threat to American democracy. I certainly feel that way and have for some time. And you can think right now about Donald Trump as sort of the embodiment of the threat to our democracy and the threat to our republic, but the ideology behind that threat is very much uh, this virulent way of thinking that uh, the United States is somehow a Christian nation, that it was founded as such, and that there's only one real way to be an American, and that is to be a Christian, and in particular, um, a fundamentalist conservative Christian. Um, that's dangerous. And I love the way Amanda Tyler, as a person of faith, as a Christian, is not afraid to talk about it as such. Because one of the biggest challenges I've had um, as a non-religious person is that um, when I talk about this, uh, I often encounter um, an awkwardness out there. People don't like to criticize religion and Christianity. There's tremendous deference in our country given uh, to religion, and, and you know that's, that's okay. That can be a good thing. But when religion comes after your democracy, you got to be able to talk about it. And so this challenge of the hypersensitivity we have, and, and I would call it as a non-religious person, Christian privilege, that sort of insulates criticism uh, of something that uh, purports to be Christian or religious, but is actually quite dangerous. We've got to find ways to talk about it. And it's why Amanda is such an incredible messenger, because she comes at it from a place of faith, but also a place of real clarity in terms of what it, what it means for democracy. That's why I invited her to be my guest at the State of the Union uh, address in Washington this last year. I was proud to have her there, to introduce her to my colleagues, and to help make the point, my, my goal at least was to help make the point that people of faith and non-believers have common cause here. We're part of an interfaith uh, Team America to push back against this threat 
to our democracy and our uh, fundamental rights. So that's why I'm delighted that she's here. She's written a book that uh, I am excited to hear more about and to read myself. And um, again, I think whether you're a person of faith uh, or a free thinker or an infidel like me, uh, you're going to have a lot uh, to think about when you hear uh, Amanda's words. And I, I think all of us uh, will very much enjoy her book. So welcome, Amanda. Great to have you here. Thanks so much, Congressman, and thanks to all of you for being here today in person and online. Um, I thought I'd, I'm going to read a little bit about why I wrote this book, um, but wanted, I think, maybe to give some helpful context of where I'm coming from and how I got involved in the work of trying to end Christian nationalism and defend the separation of church and state. Uh, you might have been surprised from the introduction that someone who leads a group called Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty is about ending Christian nationalism. And that's a real sad commentary, I think, because for, for two reasons. One, the way that the terms religious liberty and religious freedom have been so co-opted recently, um, where it's not really about religious freedom for everyone, but religious freedom for a privileged few. Um, and also because I think there's not as much information out there about the Baptist contributions to religious freedom and separation of church and state. Um, the fact that our uh, my Baptist forebears included someone named Roger Williams, Roger Williams, who was himself a very early victim of Christian nationalism when he fell out of favor of the ruling class in the Massachusetts Bay Colony and was banished, um, left in the wilderness to die. But he survived and, of course, uh, found his way to a place that he uh, named Providence and founded there the first Baptist church in America. Um, and so he uh, founded uh, that area as a haven for religious freedom for all people. Um, and is so is from that legacy that came the organization that I lead now, Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty, which is headquartered on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. We have been around for 88 years, and our work has been focused on advocacy for most of that time advocacy and education in Washington before Congress, filing briefs before the U.S. Supreme Court, working with the administration. Um, but it was several years ago where we saw this rising tide of Christian nationalism and felt compelled to start this campaign called Christians Against Christian Nationalism. We started the campaign in 2019, um, 18 months before January 6th. Um, we were starting to sound the alarm about the dangers of Christian nationalism to our democracy. Um, and then we all saw that urgent da danger to democracy and how Christian nationalism helped fuel the attack. Um, and so over time doing my speaking and doing this work, um, I, I decided to write a book to share these experiences of how to end Christian nationalism with more people. And so I just would, to kind of get us started and give you a little frame, I'm just going to read a few pages from the introduction. When did you become radicalized about Christian nationalism? The question from the journalist jarred me. I had never thought of myself as a radical about anything. I'm a mild-mannered person, and friends have long remarked on my ability to remain outwardly calm and collected in stressful situations. As an attorney, I've spent my career steeped in rational inquiry, measured analysis, and logical argument. I'm a lifelong Baptist, and I lead a religious advocacy group, so I spend a lot of time preaching, participating in Bible studies, serving on church committees, and going to potlucks. I'm also a mother, so I have volunteered for the PTA, packed countless lunches, and read many bedtime stories. I wasn't sure what was so radical about days spent reading Supreme Court opinions, writing sermons, and making dinner for my family. I also associate the term radicalized with extremist violence, something that must be roundly condemned no matter its source. We see radicalization all around us in the nation and the world, and I had never thought of the term as having anything to do with me. How did working to maintain the separation of church and state and to protect faith freedom for all people become radical? But the reporter's question was telling. She was correct that I had taken up this cause— to dismantle Christian nationalism, particularly in white Christian communities, as my life's calling. 
She was also correct that a white Christian working to uproot instead of perpetuate Christian nationalism was still something of a rarity. A Christian countering Christian nationalism was sufficiently different from what she expected that it was appeared radical, even extreme. What a sad commentary on our times. I hope to make the idea of a Christian working to end Christian nationalism the norm rather than the exception, and I am inviting you to help me. In my many years of studying and then speaking about Christian nationalism in churches, community centers, campuses, and countless Zoom rooms, I have learned that a large and diverse community of people is eager to challenge the political ideology of Christian nationalism. But the problem can seem too big and amorphous to know where to start. This book lays out a step-by-step process for exploring the problem of Christian nationalism and taking action to defend religious freedom for all. We will not end Christian nationalism if Christians do not actively work to dismantle it, to rid it from ourselves, our congregations, and our larger communities. For Christians who are committed to this cause, basing our activism in our faith provides the motivation and the sustenance to persevere in this hard work. And make no mistake, this will not be an easy road. Christian nationalism is deeply entrenched in U.S. society. Because generations have let Christian nationalism fester, the ideology has grown deep roots, creating an underground system that makes it that much harder to extricate. Nor can this outcome, ending Christian nationalism, be accomplished in my lifetime or yours. We must accept that a problem that has gone unaddressed for centuries will take several generations to resolve. This book offers a starting place for each person willing to contribute to this multi-generational project. It does not, however, make false promises about how smoothly or quickly this work will go. I hope that this book will be helpful to you no matter who you are. I expect it will be particularly useful for my fellow Christians who are feeling compelled to respond to Christian nationalism. In various points in this book, we will explore how deeply interconnected racism is with Christian nationalism. White Christians need to learn the history, question assumptions, and be willing to shift our own narratives about what it means to be Christian and what it means to be American. We also need to raise our self-awareness, particularly our awareness around about the power we hold because of our whiteness, to avoid the very real danger of perpetuating white Christian nationalism in our efforts to dismantle it. Though my primary audience is white Christians who want to engage in this long-haul work of ending Christian nationalism, I hope this book will be a helpful resource to people of color, people from other religious traditions, and people who are non-religious, who are part of or want to join the large movement to end Christian nationalism. And then I quote from my favorite Bible verse, which is Micah 6, 8, for what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And so then I end here. I consider this book to be an act of doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly. I undertake this project with humility, knowing that a vast community of organizers, advocates, activists, scholars, journalists, faith leaders, lawyers, and others are engaged in this work. My hope is that my story and the stories and wisdoms of others I share here will inspire an even larger group of people to join this cause. We're going to get to the questions in just a minute. And one of those people that I sought the wisdom of for this book was none other than your Congressman Jared Huffman, um, who... I I want you all to know, if you don't know already, has been the leader in Congress, I think, um, of calling out Christian nationalism and doing so with a lot of political courage, um, because this is not an issue that most members of Congress are even willing to recognize exists, let alone speak so boldly against it. Um, And so uh, we've, I think it was... um, 
soon after Baptist Joint Committee worked with the Freedom From Religion Foundation to put out a report about all the instances of Christian nationalism, both on January 6th itself, but also in all the lead-up rallies leading up to January 6th, um, we put that report out and shared it with members of Congress, and, and uh, you invited me to be uh, a speaker uh, to the Free Thought Caucus on a Zoom call to talk about the findings and to learn more about Christian nationalism. Um, and so it was from, from that early introduction that was now, um, it, that was in 2022, um, that we've continued this partnership, I think really embodying what we're talking about, about this diverse coalition of people who are needed um, to do the work of ending Christian nationalism. But I truly believe um, that it is Christians who need to be taking the leading role here, um, because we can call out Christian nationalism with great authenticity about how it's such a gross distortion, not only of our constitutional democracy and foundational ideas of religious freedom for all, but a gross distortion of the teachings of Jesus and what an authentic Christian life looks like. And so I'd love to read just briefly from the section that Congressman Huffman is in. In the book, I the chapters are written as um, steps. So it, like I said, it, it really is, a, in a sense, a kind of, of guidebook or handhold for people who are really interested in doing the work but not really knowing where to start. Um, and so one of the later chapters um, is called Take Your Place in the Public Square, and it's really about encouraging broader advocacy. Um, and I have a section here called Can We Find Common Cause with Non-Religious People? And here's what I write. One of my closest allies in the effort to end Christian nationalism these past several years has been Congressman Jared Huffman, a Democrat from California, who co-founded and co-chairs the Congressional Free Thought Caucus and who openly identifies as a secular non-believer. In March 2022, Representative Huffman delivered what is believed to be the first floor speech in the U.S. House of Representatives about Christian nationalism. Is it okay if I read your speech? Okay. It's a dramatic reading. <laughs> I feel like I should give it to you to read. <laughs> uh, I, he, he said, uh, I rise today to bring attention to a dangerous ideology threatening our democracy, white Christian nationalism. Most members of Congress don't even know what it means, but experts from the Freedom From Religion Foundation and the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty have studied it for years, and their new report shows this movement was at the heart of the January 6th insurrection. White Christian nationalism fuses Christianity with a rigid view of civic life, a view that true Americans are white, native-born, and conservative. On January 6th, it was the connective tissue that tied disparate groups together and propelled them to action. It's infecting our government from members of Congress and top officials in the previous administration to the wife of a Supreme Court justice whose messages to the president's chief of staff leading up to the insurrection smacked of white Christian nationalism. Thankfully, good Americans, people of faith and non-believers, are standing up to this violent ideology. I call on members of Congress to educate themselves about white Christian nationalism and reaffirm the separation of church and state. <laughs> Which, whichever staff member wrote that speech for me did really good work. I, I like it. Um, thank you, Amanda. Can I pick up kind of where you left off with that um, January 6th? Because I think it's an important part of the conversation about Christian nationalism. Um, the January 6th Select Committee that we created, that we tried to make bipartisan, and they said, okay, we'll do bipartisan if you do it just like the 9-11 Commission, and then we said, okay, and then Kevin McCarthy said, um, never mind, we don't want any part of it. And we had to go snag Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger and kind of proceed with our own bipartisan effort. But it got to the bottom of so many important uh, historical facts about this insurrection. And the record was just filled with Christian nationalism. There was testimony and depositions about how these radical hate preachers were such a driving force. Um, Amanda referred to the lead up to January 6th. There were months and months spent in these so-called Jericho marches, 
where these, these radical, violent hate preachers were whipping people into a frenzy, telling them January 6th was going to be like Jericho, where the walls were going to come down. And, you know, Joshua and Jericho, would you agree, maybe one of the more violent parts of the Old Testament? Absolutely. Yeah. If we're really banning yeah. books for violence. It was not a day of love. Right, it was exactly. not a day of love in Jericho or uh, on January 6th. And so, you know, all of this is out there. It's so obvious from the images we, we saw, from the the, the uh, signs and the slogans. These preachers were on site, you know, blowing shofars as if it were, you know, a replication of the Jericho slaughter. Um, and yet, when they closed the record and went to write the report from the select committee, Liz Cheney refused to sign off on anything that criticized Christian nationalism. And so she did that because she didn't want to disparage her own faith and the faith of millions of people who are, you know, Christians of good faith. But it left an incomplete record, and this is an important part of what happened that day. Uh, so it speaks to the challenge that I run into so often. Um, again, I alluded to it at the beginning, calling it Christian privilege. It makes it hard to just talk truthfully about what's going on, and it's one of the reasons why I'm so glad that Amanda is fearless as a person of faith, as a Christian, in calling this out and calling it for what it is. But um, January 6th. Yeah. So I am glad, I'm so glad you brought that up because I think that's a uh, part of the history of the select committee that a lot of people don't know about. And it was at, right after that, um, that your colleague that you work so closely with, Representative Jamie Raskin, invited me to provide testimony to the committee that he chaired, a uh, subcommittee of the House Oversight Committee, so that I could testify on the record. And when I did so, I became, you were the first person to make a floor speech. I was the first person to be invited to provide testimony before a congressional committee on Christian nationalism. And I have now done so two times. And sometimes when I'm in, uh, you know, audiences, people will stop and applaud that. And I said, don't applaud. I don't want to be the only person who's ever been invited to give testimony on this topic. Um, we, at the same time, we have seen over the course of my working on this issue over the past five years, um, we've seen a normalization of Christian nationalism. When I first started out, um, people said we made up the term. There's no such thing as Christian nationalism. Leaders like uh, Tony Perkins, for instance, said that um, right after we started our campaign, said we were just calling names and making things up. Um, and it wasn't three years later that Marjorie Taylor Greene, another colleague in, in the U.S. House, um, said that she was a proud Christian nationalist and that the Republican Party should become the party of Christian nationalism. And while we didn't have a lot of people seconding her, we also didn't have anybody pushing back from the Republican Party on her call to become the party of Christian nationalism. So we've seen a normalization of the language and the violence on one side. And what I argue is we need to normalize speaking out against Christian nationalism and that particularly Christians need to do so. And so just weeks after that, we were so disappointed um, when the report came out and there was no mention of Christian nationalism. Uh, so we at Christians Against Christian Nationalism organized a sunrise vigil on January 6, 2023, um, where we both uh, bore remembrance to what happened, but also said publicly Christian nationalism was a part of what happened, uh, what happened on that fateful day. And so I think on this issue, you know, members of Congress can only be so politically brave because they have constituents that they are voting to represent. And so we need more people of those constituents telling their members of Congress, this is a big concern for me. I want you to be speaking out against Christian nationalism. And part of the book is to really try to encourage that. Um, uh, someone here earlier today said, "Am I going to leave here really depressed about the election?" So I'm going to, I'm going to, maybe we're going to depress you, and then we're going to bring you back up to have some hopeful moments before the end. Uh, the depressing part of all of this, particularly as we're leading up to the election, is that in many ways January 6th could have been could be a dry run for what we're about to experience. And over the last few years. Um, I have, again, gone deep on this topic, and part of my research, um, at the time I didn't know I was writing a book, uh, but just part of my research on the work, 
I attended um, a gathering called the Reawaken America Tour. Um, if you're not familiar with what the Reawaken America Tour is, it's a traveling roadshow of conspiracy theories, election denialism. Mike Flynn is uh, a regular. Yes, and Christian nationalism. So Mike Flynn is is one of the main speakers, um, disgraced former general. Um, and at one of the early stops on the Reawaken America tour, he said the quiet part out loud. He said, you know, we're one nation under God. We need one religion in this country. Um, so he's very clear about what the aims for this event are. And so I went to one of the tour stops uh, that was held uh, on a Trump property in Miami. And we, the lead up, we, I first went to a meeting called Pastors for Trump um, and stood there while I heard all of these uh, pastors who were really invoking a lot of violence, um, using uh, cherry picked quotes out of the Bible to say that we were justified in violence, um, and then went to the next day and just heard conspiracy theory after conspiracy theory with praise and worship songs and Bible verses and preaching all interlaced in. And I watched, you know, what I saw from the stage was pretty predictable and things I'd seen before, but I watched the people around me and I saw how caught up people were getting in this rhetoric and how for them it really was a religious experience. You know, I think in the past I had kind of dismissed this. Uh, this really doesn't have anything to do with religion. And for the people from the stage, I still kind of think it does not. But for the people who were there, um, this was so deeply connected to how they experienced faith that it has a different impact than if they were just going to a political rally. And then to kind of seal the deal, and I do write about this in the book, um, on the patio, they had a big galvanized metal tub where they baptized people in the in the tub. Um, and so people would line up in whatever they were wearing, many of them Trump shirts or QAnon shirts. They would get down in the tub and there was no, there were no, no liturgy, no words given, and they would just dunk them into the water over and over again. Well, I'm a Baptist. I was dunked as a seven-year-old, but not into this personality cult or this, you know, following of at any cost into a political leader, but rather dedicating my life to following Jesus. And it was just horrifying to see this central um, symbol of my faith being used and co-opted, um, not just in service of electing a, a presidential candidate, but even more so in service of some kind of violent takeover of American democracy, um, because throughout the event, the piece of the Constitution that was most emphasized was the Second Amendment, you know, talking about their Second Amendment rights and all and being ready to go and making sure that people knew that this was something so that this is my depressing part of the speech. Um, but the the piece that I think I think the realism is really important that we understand and are are wide eyed about what is going to be a motivating factor um, in potential election related violence as we as we lead up to the election and how crucial it will be for this diverse coalition to call out what we're seeing and to really try to extricate it. Um, but as I read in the introduction, no matter what happens in November, this is going to be a problem for a long time. This is not just a part problem with Trump. This is not just a part problem with the Republican Party. Um, this is a problem that's really inherent in American society. This idea of Christian privilege, Christian supremacy, white supremacy, um, and uh, a version of religious freedom, a, a really distorted version of religious freedom that's about taking over government uh, in order to impose one's religious beliefs on everyone else. Um, a piece of my biography we haven't talked to, I'm, I'm a visitor to California. I live in Dallas, Texas. Um, I am very familiar with what a theocratic takeover of government looks like. Um, because that's happening in Texas right now. Um, there's a chapter in the book about um, really calling out how Christian nationalism is impacting public schools. And I talk, and that's where I think we're really seeing um, whether it be, you know, moves to post the Ten Commandments in public school classrooms, 
Um, Mandatory I, chaplains and all the other, yeah. Exactly. The chaplain bill that came out of uh, Texas, if you're not familiar, um, this is a first of its kind. It, it first passed in Texas um, that said that encouraged school districts to hire or accept as volunteers school chaplains. And you might wonder what a school chaplain is. Well, in the legislation, a school chaplain is defined as anyone who can pass a criminal background check. Which rules out a lot of the pastors that were at the awakening. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, but it, what it doesn't require is any kind of special training, any kind of licensure, any ability to work with children. And there's no restriction in the law about what the chaplains can do, you know, when they're with their, so they can proselytize, engage in religious counseling. And the Texas legislature is so extreme, they actually voted down an amendment that would have required parental consent. Um, so again, that's the depressing part. The encouraging part is the way that they passed the law, it didn't automatically go in, went, go into effect. It required school districts to take a vote on whether or not they wanted to start such a program. And that's where we at Baptist Joint Committee, working with a lot of other groups, kind of sprung into action. We contacted our chaplains, people who are actually licensed chaplains, and organized them to write a letter that said, you know, this is really offensive to our professional standing as chaplains, and we think this is completely inappropriate in a public school context. Um, so a lot of, for the, a lot of people in Texas, the first time they ever heard about this law was saying chaplains don't want the chaplain law. So that's pretty good messaging. And then we organized people to go to their school boards. Um, and at the end of this, they had a six month period to consider it. 1,200 school districts in Texas I know of one that adopted to expand the program. And so there is there are opportunities for resistance. And I think what this shows is that these um, theocratic leaders who are taking over certain state legislatures um, are really out of step with the majority of Americans, even in conservative states, right? And so this is not a mainstream view, but it's a view that is funded by uh, very well-funded interests. Um, I was recently quoted in an article that was in the New York Times Magazine by a uh, ProPublica Pro uh, reporter named Ava Kaufman. I worked with her on, I talked with her for her article, and it was about how two billionaires in Texas have basically um, bought the Texas legislature. And so, and they are, have, these two people are very heavily influenced by Christian nationalism. Um, and so, just understanding kind of what, we're up against really helps in order to help fuel a, a real movement from the people um, to push back against theocracy. And we're at a real inflection point in our country about whether we are going to commit to continuing the democratic pro process and the, the democratic project um, that we're about, or are we going to fall back into authoritarian theocracy? Um, so that's, that's the moment we're in. Yeah, Jonathan, are we at? Uh, tell me when it's time for questions. Okay, uh, sure. Yeah. So there's a part of this conversation that um, Amanda can speak to way better than me, a and that is how Christian nationalists uh, and and their extremist allies have, um, in the view of many people of faith, hijacked Christianity, um, and they they will uh, cherry pick pieces of the Bible. The, Matthew, go ye to make make believers of all nations or something like that. Uh, there's a lot of authoritarian provisions in the Bible where they talk about kingdoms and things like that. And there's some violent stuff in the Bible, too. Now, there's a lot of love thy neighbor beatitude stuff as well. Um, and that's why I'm really grateful for love thy neighbor Christians like uh, Amanda here. But um, they have stitched together a really dark and violent and authoritarian, anti-democratic, both religion and ideology. Uh, and when they dunk those people in that tank, that's what people are signing up for as a religion and, and a political um, agenda. Talk a little bit about the battle that's raging within Christianity uh, for the kind of the heart and soul uh, of the religion. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I talk about this both in the book and in my public speaking on the topic um, to remind people that this is a very old problem, that, uh, you know, really Christian nationalism started in about the fourth century um, when Constantine assumed uh, Christianity as an official religion and, and took the force of the empire and the violence associated with it um, to force Christianity on other people. We can think about the Crusades. Uh, we can think about European Christianity and the doctrine of discovery that used the basis of Christian theology as a permission structure for white Europeans to uh, come and take native land, right? We think about how uh, Christian theology was sacrificed in the Anglican colonies, um, where they said that baptism would not free a person of Native American, African, or mixed race descent, where they took their theology of baptism, and that we were talking about baptism earlier, and they said baptism doesn't work for civic freedom. It only works for religious freedom. And uh, then my own uh, denomination of Southern Baptist, well, I'm not Southern Baptist anymore, but I, my roots are from the Southern Baptist Convention. Southern Baptists were formed in 1845. Um, because they said that slavery was, quote, an institution of heaven. Um, so there is there are very deep roots of Christian nationalism in Christianity itself. And, and part of the project is for more moderate or progressive Christians who who don't view themselves as being bought into Christian nationalism, who would never associate themselves with the Reawaken America tour, the January 6th insurrection, but to have some self-examination about how we, I'm, I'm using myself, we in this have, have also inherited and bought into some of the Christian nationalism that's over centuries been baked into our religion and really challenging all of us to do the hard work of self-interrogation and then the work of moving closer to the teachings of Jesus. You know, Jesus was always on the side of the marginalized and the oppressed. Uh, Jesus was killed by the state um, for speaking truth to power and bears no resemblance um, to the Jesus that's used as a mascot for the Christian nationalist movement. Um, and so really understanding how how Christians are can all be a part of this self-examination and this work of dismantling Christian nationalism, I think is so important. Um, we certainly do have some very prominent Christian religious leaders who have completely bought in to Christian nationalism. And I, I mentioned some of them here. That's not my main focus for the book, but it's important to, to point them out. Um, but what we really need is for the the majority of American Christians to get more actively involved in pushing back against it. Um, because I really believe um, both the majority of Americans and, and the public polling bears this out. The majority of Americans and the majority of American Christians um, are, are not wanting to associate or move closer into Christian nationalism. I am, I'm really rooting for Amanda's side in that uh, struggle within Christianity for the heart and soul of the faith because her side works just fine with democracy, uh, and the other side does not. The other side is on a collision course with democracy. So, you know, we've all kind of got a stake uh, in the outcome of that. I worry about it somewhat, because I know that the, um, the type of Christianity that Amanda um, practices and believes in has been losing numbers. And the part of Christianity that's growing right now, according to the Pew Research polling and everything else, is this uh, hyper-militarized, hyper-masculine uh, Christianity that that is on the march, really, that is part of this movement? Uh, but you're not giving up. No, not all. And I'll, I'll say the fastest growing segment are those who are not claiming a faith tradition, right? And so, and and some of them are humanists, and some of them are atheists, and some of them are actually probably still in some way have a Christian theology, but nothing that they see offered by traditional Christian audiences is, is appealing to them in large part because of Christian nationalism, right? And so um, that's another reason, I think, um, for, for those who do care about an authentic Christian witness to push back against Christian nationalism and make, a, make 
it known that there's a home for someone who still wants to be a Christian, but not be associated with Christian nationalism. Shall we open the floor up to some questions? Raise a hand if you have one, and we'll go around the room. I actually just wanted to, um, first and foremost, thank you so much for speaking out and being here, especially in this community. Um, I feel like we're a little bit more diverse here, right, in California, more progressive thinking. Um, but this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, my husband's family has been torn apart by this um, topic, and they're actually um, more recent immigrants from the Philippines. So this is not a topic that is only a white problem or a problem in the Bible Belt. This is happening here in the Bay Area. It's a huge problem. And with that being said, my question to you is, how can I be a part of, you know, the bigger solution? Um, I'm a young working mom. I'm obviously busy. Um, and so I feel like helpless at times. Like what can I do as one little person? Um, if that makes any sense. Sorry, I'm a little emotional, but thank you so much for being here and for standing up. Thank you. Well, I wrote this book for, for you and for people like you really, because when I go out and speak, the number one question I get after I lay out the information is what can I do? Just exactly what you said. And it not, not one of us can solve this problem, but all of us have a stake in this problem and have something that we can do. So some of the ideas um, here, there's a whole chapter on taking on Christian nationalism close to home with some ideas on how to have a hard conversation with people that we love um, about this topic that is not about changing their minds but about understanding better where they're coming from, right? And and to think about how do we really, you know, and then also just like joining together. There's another, I think, really critical chapter in here about organizing for change. And when I think about the Bay Area, I think about having such an active organizing community, but how do we think about integrating the work of ending Christian nationalism into some of those organizing movements. Um, so ways in the, in the Christian tradition, we talk about creating the beloved community. And so there are ways that an organizing coalition can really work to create that beloved community. What's the antidote to Christian nationalism? It's the love and equality across all lines of difference and taking care of our neighbor in the Christian language, loving our neighbors as we would love God. So are there ways, you know, to connect and find groups on the ground that want to do it or even to start having conversations and understanding it better? Um, I also encourage people to get involved in advocacy at the local school level. Um, we talked a little bit about local, you know, how Christian nationalism is being, um, you know, really pushed in public school contexts. I, I acknowledge that it's probably less of a problem here than it is in Texas, but at the same time, um, the organizing from those who have bought into Christian nationalism, I think they've they've really been all over the country and targeting school boards, targeting libraries with book bans and other kinds of content bans. So how so just getting a little bit more engaged and involved at that level. Or even as I mentioned earlier, well, I don't know whose congressional district you are in, but encouraging your member, if they're not Congressman Huffman, to speak out against Christian nationalism and raising and, you know, just I, I really think if there was like a letter writing campaign to members of Congress about people being concerned about Christian nationalism, that there we would see some movement on opinions there. Um, so those are just a few ideas. But I guess the encouragement is. Um, that, you know, not to be overwhelmed by the enormity of the problem because that can lead to a sense of total helplessness um, when it's really about each of us kind of understanding if we're going to save this democracy, we are all going to be required to get a little more actively involved in the work. Just yeah, we're going to have to have some uncomfortable conversations, but I think having them the way Amanda just suggested is, is the right way. I'm Marilee, and I want to thank you for both you two for what you're doing. I totally agree. Uh, I, I would, you know, you would hear all these stories like like on uh, 
when they were, you know, running all over the Capitol. And it's like, I said to myself, wow, you know, this isn't love. This isn't kindness. You know, what is this? And uh, it was, it wasn't Christianity, you know, and I think something really important is calling people on, you know, their behavior and calling them on it because there's so much lying going on. Lying is becoming a norm. And, you know, we, we've almost got to, you know, call it out and say, hey, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not it. But you, you also get the idea of everybody wanting power and, you know, everybody wanting money, right? Maybe that's the basis of it. I don't know, but I am from San Antonio, Texas, <laughs> and uh, I, I know what you're talking about, but it, it's, it's everywhere. So, thank you. Can I just say, you sort of mentioned money and power in passing, but I think that's the heart of it, actually. Uh, and, you know, Amanda's writing an important book on this issue. Another really important one was written by a friend of ours named Catherine Stewart called The, the Power Worshippers. And it's all about how this Christian nationalist movement has sort of eschewed the um, the nicer elements of Christianity and just gone all in for power. And there's a lot of money tied up in that power. There's a whole um, theological movement now called Seven Mountains Dominion, which is all about conquest and domination. And again, you can find pieces in the Bible that these cynical demagogues have stitched together to support this Seven Mountains Dominion theology, and it is all about imposing and controlling uh, and taking over literally the world. Um, it's, it's insane, but that's, that's what we're up against, and money and power is at the heart of it, not any notion of Christianity that Amanda and other people of good faith would, uh, would recognize. Finding that this is a global issue, or or is it more uh, U.S.? I know you're focused on the U.S., but are you finding it's a global phenomenon? Putin, Orban, dictators in Africa. There are there is a through line uh, in this type of Christian nationalism, and and some of our own Christian nationalist groups are working with those people around the world uh, in in a really dark way because you know they literally believe that the imperative that their interpretation of Christianity holds for them is to take over the world and to impose a Christian government on the world. Okay, sorry, and for interrupting, but then you said there's this this power and money component, but then you've got the followers or the converts who probably aren't doing it for those reasons. They're doing it for their needs. Yeah, I can speak to that, yeah. I mean, I think a helpful frame that I've learned is that Christian nationalism is a political ideology and a cultural framework. And it's also this well-funded, highly organized political movement, right? And and Catherine Stewart is, I think, one of the um, leading experts on the movement side of Christian nationalism. I know about it, but that's not really my expertise. I've concentrated on understanding the ideology and the cultural framework and, and work because they both are needed to have this crisis that we're having right now because the the movement side is not the major, majority right that but they have the money and the power and they're trying to to gain power and then never let it go right with change but ignoring the constitution entirely changing the rules of the game voter suppression you know all down the line right that having lots of guns yes using force when when necessary in their minds necessary to achieve their aims um, but the movement side is only successful if they have followers right and it's the the followers though are not just the the most extreme who have bought into for example dominionism theology which is like this idea that Christians and not just any Christians but fundamentalist Christians have to take over every sector of society and that that's God's will for the country um, that is one segment of it, but that's not the majority. But the people who have just kind of bought into a softer side of Christian nationalism, a kind of civil religion, a kind that, what's so wrong about posting the Ten Commandments in the public schools? Or why don't we have government-sponsored prayer in public schools? That's the side um, that is then able to be exploited by the messaging of the movement, is kind of how I 
have come to to view it because you've still at least now you still have to have a majority to get elected into office here right and so they don't have the majority on their side for authoritarianism so they have to exploit through some of this messaging and then they'll change the rules of the game that's the scary part yeah that's the really scary part Uh, yeah. My question's been answered. Oh, okay. Sure. Question behind me. Oh, hi. I wanted to thank you for your podcast. You and your partner, uh, I've just learned a lot from you. Um, I'm a former evangelical, and what I have found is they've just hurt the credibility of the faith so much that people, if you say you're a Christian, they go, well, what kind? And I had never heard that before. Um, but when I left the church, I realized how strong their youth programs were. And when I went into like Episcopal churches or other, they have so few youth programs. And that's why parents often go to those big mega churches. So whether the kids stay in the faith when they get older, I'm not so sure about that, given the level of hypocrisy that we're seeing. So thank you for your work. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Um, it's Respecting Religion. We just started our sixth season, and we talk about faith, freedom, uh, religion, the law, and what's at stake for faith, freedom today is our so it, two lawyers talking about issues of church state law. I had a quick question that jumps off of that one. Uh, what are the trend lines showing for the younger generations in terms of uh, what they might be thinking, what they might be heading towards, how that might affect the overall uh, position of Christian nationalism in the, in the future? So the sociologists and the researchers who measure Christian nationalism show the younger you are, the less likely you are to buy into Christian nationalism. Um, and I believe that's why there is such a concerted effort to push Christian nationalism in the public schools, yeah. um, because it, it, in order to, to adopt the ideology, you have to be uh, indoctrinated into the ideology. And so they're very much doing that. For instance, um, changing the way that civics is taught, questioning the whole, you know, we have a speaker of the house who doesn't believe separation of church and state exists. Um, and many uh, she calls it so-called separation of church and state. <laughs> and then we have public school curriculum in states like Texas and Florida that are not teaching the separation of church and state and are instead teaching the pseudo history of America as a Christian nation. So um, so it's a concerted effort to change what is the natural trend line that people who are younger don't adopt this ideology. Okay. Uh, Jared, I think I'm going to leave the last question to you. <laughs> oh, my gosh, the last question for me. Um, you know, uh, Amanda, it, it does, uh, you, you've referenced this a couple times, and I always come back to it, too, because this can be so disheartening, this whole subject. And the stakes are super high. I mean, we're not exaggerating when we talk about the violence and the direct assault on democracy and uh, the future of this republic. Um, but I, I am continually... Um, reassured when I think about the fact that most people, overwhelmingly, whether they're religious or not, and if they are religious, whatever their religion, they don't want to live in a creepy theocracy. That's just the bottom line. And what these folks are selling is a creepy, authoritarian, I'm going to control your life, I'm going to impose all of my extreme things on you. It's deeply unpopular uh, across all kinds of different lines, especially with the young people that you asked about. Jonathan. So we've got a lot going for us in this as well. The problem is um, they know how unpopular their agenda is, and that's why they're going to try to uh, use undemocratic means to actually end democracy so that they can, you know, they talk openly about this, that uh, it doesn't take a majority to have power, uh, that, you know, they've even run calculations and, and they cite biblical provisions to show that, you know, in the in the church, that it was, I guess, ordained. I mean, you would know this, Amanda. <laughs> I didn't learn this part of the. <laughs> that there are there are some uh, so, some creepy ways that they justify the idea that a few people with the right ideas should be able to control the masses. And uh, you know, from the look at the anti-democratic tools they're using: the Supreme Court, right, uh, the United States Senate. 
trying to make less people vote, not more, and all of the different attacks on democracy. One of the lead speakers at CPAC this year, which has become just a Christian nationalist bonanza, um, said, welcome to the end of democracy. That was how he opened the conference. So, um, it, it, you know, they're not subtle about any of this. They understand that the rest of the country, the rest of the world doesn't want to live in this creepy theocracy. They're going to have to tear down democracy to get there, and they're ready to do it. questions. Um, so I was a public school teacher here in, in uh, Marin for 40, uh, 40 years, and then I've been retired for 18 years, I think, something like that. But anyway, we were required to say the pledge every day. Where are we with that now? I mean, that's, you know... Which pledge? The one that was I existed mean, before McCarthyism or after? <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, I say the pledge, but I don't say the words under God, because yeah. that was a McCarthyist add-on. Uh, and I think we've got a lot of things like that, whether it's the in God we trust on our currency to any number of ways in which, and this is creeping Christian nationalism. Yeah. This is the way, you know, you, you normalize it in little baby steps and then pretty soon they point to all of that and say, see, we're a Christian nation. Look at our money. Look at our pledge. Look at all these different things. It's dangerous. And it seems like you're, you know, maybe fighting about a little thing. Uh, but, you know, the defense of church-state separation requires, Madison talked about perfect separation of church and state, which we've never had. I mean, from the, from the beginning of our founding, which was intended to be perfect separation, we have been imperfect, and we are continually invited to be more imperfect in that separation. Imperfect union. <laughs> And I, I, I think just final word that I would offer, I agree with that completely, that these small instances of creeping civil religion or Christian nationalism um, contribute to, to a whole. And the Supreme Court um, has completely abandoned no establishment principles that are half of what it means to have religious freedom in this country, that they, they are not protecting religious freedom for all people. And so the vision then is not, is this constitutional or not, because we can't even use that as a basis anymore. But rather, does it promote what I view as the constitutional promise of belonging equally without regard to religion, belief, or identity? Right, that's the constitutional promise, and I think that's the promise that we're all about when we're looking to end Christian nationalism. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Let's put a round, hands together and a round of applause for Jared and Amanda. Thank you so much for joining us online.